Well, Russ, I really appreciate you taking some time to um, jump on live with us today and do some painting. Yeah, I'm totally uh, excited and intimidated. <laughs> oh, well, I think that's funny because you are, you're such a guru with video, but I guess this is your first Instagram live. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, I, we have a YouTube channel around bikes. So I'm comfortable, like, riffing about bikes, but art, art not so much. You know, I, I dabble for sure, but, you know, I, I feel like sometimes I'm out of my water. Like, I, oh, I actually paint, I painted the picture before just so I could remember which colors I planted. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. And um, I, I think you're, uh, um, I think you're being humble there. I really love your paintings, and I hope that everyone who's jumping on has had a chance to to check them out because um, you have a real sense of like space and atmosphere with your work that and I've been on a bit of a kick with our toolkit with bikes lately because one, one yeah. I love bicycles and I feel like bikes too are having a moment with the pandemic and oh, sure. spring and like um, an alternative to transportation public transportation that a lot of people are turning to bikes and like making them accessible and that seems that you know a lot of what you're promoting is exploring the recreational side of biking yeah and also combining whatever pre-existing you know passion you have you know a lot of people coming into cycling now during covid probably don't identify as cyclists you know they're just using it as a tool for exercise or to explore and you know you don't have to be a cyclist to, to ride a bike and you can incorporate other hobbies like we live in montana and there's like a, a trout stream about 100 yards away so bike over there with a fly rod or you know i'll pedal up into the hills here with the with the, the paint set so it's just a good tool to, to to explore i think kind of like how you use you use art to interpret the world i use a bike to kind of you know do something similar awesome yeah yeah and i love that you embrace the the party pace of <laughs> yes <you know. laughs> it's it's much better than saying i ride slow i just ride party pace you know <laughs> It's, it's more oh, affirmative. <laughs> I'm all over that. <laughs> yeah. Um, would you want to share a little bit of your um, art background and bike background? Maybe how you got into them, and then we'll we'll dive into doing some painting together. Yeah. So I'll start with the bikes. That's a little bit easier. Um, over, I think about 12 years ago, I was living in Southern California, and my truck died, and I was really lazy, <laughs> and I didn't want to get it repaired. So I started walking. Um, and then, you know, at the time I was actually smoking two packs a day and I just started coughing up phlegm. I was like, oh, this is totally terrible. So by my car dying, it got me into walking, into taking transit and then ultimately bicycling. And, uh, in Los Angeles, it's, it feels like a subversive act because there's so many roads, so you can actually avoid the main roads. And since then just kind of fell in love with it. We, my partner and I traveled across the country, uh, New Zealand um you know bike touring and when we stopped traveling i started the youtube channel and kind of share that that love for for cycling in terms of art uh not formally trained trained by the the school of youtube <laughs> <laughs> so definitely you know mind of watercolor has been a, a great resource yeah, uh, shout think, out to steve mitchell <laughs> we'll have to get yeah. him on sometime <laughs> <laughs> there's this uh, guy i think he's a gary tucker i don't know if you stumbled upon his YouTube channel, but I, I think he, he, he must teach it, but he, he, when he does a painting, he really talks about what he thinks about the light and cool and all that thing and all that stuff. And that's been uh, most, mostly my teaching. Although my dad is actually a fine art painter, uh, he paints in oils. And he's actually fairly well established as like a California plein air artist. So I grew up with art um, as a child, but never really embraced it until, um, until just about two years ago when I was looking for something to do other than edit videos for YouTube on the computer. <laughs> I wanted something analog. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm, I love that you said that because, you know, I think urban sketching over the past, you know, I feel like 15 years has really grown in popularity. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's sort of the, the inverse correlation of, you know, the rise of all our smartphones and then this analog. And that, that's part of what I love about sketching is this chance to like, turn off the the tech side and do something where you can't just edit undo you know you're you're in For this sure. process <laughs> yeah there's that youtube channel uh, teo who does a lot of urban sketching uh, reviews and stuff and he was a big inspiration um you know initially I, I dabbled with like pen and ink but then ultimately just wanted to do mostly just just watercolor um i don't know why but it's yeah <laughs> Yeah. Just for just for a different look. <laughs> could you could you share with us some of the the tools you use, and then um, 
we can we can pull up what we both set up here for sure all right so i'm a total nerd when it comes to bikes but few people know i'm also a total nerd when it comes to art supplies oh oh so. well, well we can nerd <laughs> out together russ check this out oh oh wow okay wait 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 so oh, usually I, I so this is a kind of a, a brush uh, holster that you put on a tripod so uh -huh. I would take this tripod with uh, this illustration board mounted to it. And you know, you need a place to hold your brushes. And what's cool about this is you can hold them sideways. Uh, the way it works is it's just slots, so it's not holes. So regardless if the, the brush is like a small diameter or a big diameter, it'll, it'll stick in there. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, so you know, instead of, cause I have a kind of a, a palette or a, a base I put here with the, with the the palette and everything, but you know sometimes the brushes roll off, so this is a great place. Um, yeah. I'm not going to use these ones because we're we're doing something fairly small. But mm -hmm. I love I love mop brushes. Um, they're just so fun to use. Like they're so tactile. And yeah. these uh, the the Vinci Casaneo I fell in love with when we were at the uh, Daniel Smith store in uh, Seattle. They had a big selection. But I also discovered these recently. These are the Lowell. Cornell, very huh. inexpensive, very inexpensive, but mm -hmm. it's got a, a good snap. Um, mm -hmm. And moving over here, a uh, little pocket palette, uh, more Woo! little more little mop brushes. You know, typically, um, you know, I'll do a big wash and, and start with these guys, and then get more granular. Um, I love these. I think you've used these as well, right? They're kind of mm -hmm. like Sumi brushes. They're so yeah. expressive, and typically mm -hmm. I kind of uh, splay it open and use it use for foliage uh, or just some kind of put some texture and pattern. So I've these. And I've actually cut these down to size mm -hmm. so it fits in the smaller bag. So I took a pipe cutter and sandpaper and sanded these down. Totally legitimate uh, to modify your else? tools. <laughs> for sure. Um, I always carry some uh, gouache. Mm -hmm. Just to put in dab and highlights. Um, typically, you know, this will be kind of the last step. Uh, just a little bit. It's like using the highlight which way your cyclist is going. Um, and then, yeah, uh, for at yeah. home, I I really love these uh, these Holbein uh, palettes. And if you've seen these, they're they're uh, steel, so they're, they're heavier in brass and they're enameled. And uh, oh yeah, I've got one of those yeah. in my studio. Yeah, those are great. Yeah. And just a little collapsible water thing. And that's about it. And this is just nothing fancy. I, I taped or I, did, I used some, um, gosh, like, uh, like rubber cement or, or JB Weld or something to put a little tripod plate. So this would ultimately go there. Yeah, and that's I really would have a simple way for that. a tripod mount. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't have any power tools. So I know that the right way, the right way, air quotes would be to put in a quarter 20 and, and drill it out and, and put an actual bolt there. So um, yeah, poor, poor man's power tools is JB Weld. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done a lot with like Velcro tape too, to uh, yeah. some of my art supplies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. And uh, oh. Switch I would, my camera here. I mentioned this. Ta -da. Oh yeah, tell everyone what that is. So this is a, this is a cordless hair dryer. <laughs> And, you know, I got interested in these because, you know, sometimes I'm very impatient and don't want to wait for the, the wash to dry. So this will turn on. Uh, you charge it up. There's a little, it comes with a little DC plug. And it's, it's cool air only. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no heating element. That's how they can power this and have air. But if you're painting outside during the summer, you know, I think it's enough to just kind of blow the ambient temperature air on there. So, yeah, you know, this is pretty cool. I'm a big fan yeah, of this. That's um, fascinating. Here's the one I use in my studio. I have a small one, too, but I've never seen that. Oh. A cordless one. Um, yeah, I'm kind of a sucker for, for really small things. I, I lived in yeah. really small houses for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is great for camping if you want to go camping and, and, and need a hairdryer. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's my 11th essential, Russ. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and, um, we'll, we'll try the. Yeah. 
how do you how you carry your supplies like when you go out sketching too that was a question i had do you have like a favorite bag that's handy with your bike or um uh, uh -huh. so I, I use numerous uh different bike bags uh, mm -hmm. typically some kind of handlebar bag i'll show you um doo -doo -doo. so one of our many bikes so something like this uh it's pretty pretty luxurious it'll definitely fit you know a small art kit um not enough not big enough for an illustration board so typically when i do ride and paint i will just use a sketchbook or just smaller format so this and, is and another that, one that bags made by our friends uh mutual friends oh yeah this is swift industries yeah so yeah swift industries made this one and they also made this one and this is a really cute one because it's designed you can see we live in montana so there's some bear spray <laughs> uh this one is designed to fit in the walled basket so super utilitarian i mean you can use any bag you want with a walled basket um but this one's also made by also made by swift and it's got a zipper closure all that good stuff so yeah oh that's great oh, that's great um well you you I've have tried, to I've, use some uh-huh uh, I've actually tried mountain biking with this one and carrying an art kit. So this is like a little hip bag. So ma many ways to carry things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a sucker for bags too. You know, I think that it's finding the, the right thing for your activity. And then, you know, if you do another one, sometimes there's another pack that just fits just right. And I know with my bike, I'm biased towards things that fit in my basket. Once I discovered uh, baskets, I was loath to ride with backpacks. <laughs> yeah, bas baskets are amazing and underrated. And yeah, let me. Oops. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh -huh. gonna move this whole table over. Uh -huh. Nice. Sorry, I had well, to pre-paint. <laughs> oh no, no, no! I was doing a little bit of practice too there. Yeah, I was curious if um. You know, something I really enjoy about you as well is, you know, you've got all these adventures you go out on and then you're doing work that's inspired some and references, you know, one of your passions mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, how you bring that back to the studio. And I wonder if maybe as we, we start to tackle um, this little composition, you might chat a little bit about, um, you know, how your, how your art and, and biking kind of fit together with inspiration or, you know, your headspace and, uh, um, yeah. each other yeah for sure um i love painting you know I'll, I'll try to do quick sketches as we as we travel on on bike but i also love painting it after the fact when we get home and what's funny is most of the most, most of the time I, I just paint off of uh off of an iphone <laughs> oh, okay. so then, so very, very small reference, but that's all you you really need you know like you don't want too much detail otherwise it clouds um you know what you're doing yeah. So. Yeah. Focus um, on shapes. Yeah. Do, do you do much editing to your photos um, before you I, dive in? Uh, no. I, in terms of Photoshop, no. I, I do editing in the, the drawing and the painting process. So mm -hmm. like that's what well, we'll do a little bit of that today. Like I'm taking the landscape from from one photo and uh, dropping in the uh, image of a cyclist from another photo. So that's one thing I do love about painting as opposed to photography is that you know, if the lights are wrong or the composition is wrong, you can change it, <laughs> and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I did print out your um, your photos you you gave us and mentioned to everyone that I've got a link in my bio um, to download these. And something I do, I, I often work also from my iPad, where I'll just edit, you know, on my iPad. Yeah. But um, something I'll often do is I'll make images black and white to just focus uh, on values too. Because frankly, I have, I have a real cheapy printer. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the colors aren't awesome. My, my iPhone, I suppose, would have, have more awesome colors. But um, yeah. that's just something in my own work I've discovered. Um, that's a good idea. You know, like uh, I wonder if like the native photo app in, um, on the iPhone can, can convert to black and white without yeah. having yeah, like, Photoshop or something. And you, yeah, okay. you can play with levels and... Um, punching stuff up. Yeah, that's pretty handy. You know, values is one of the things I'm still getting a, a grasp of. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a rel relatively newbie to to watercolor. So I I do remember like distinctly getting distracted by by color, right? Because that's the first thing you see. And you know, my, when I first started, that's all I would focus on is like color accuracy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then it would look flat. And then you, you're so granular on, on one part of the image um, so now I've definitely uh, 
shifted the mindset to to try to um to focus more on value did so you have any as as you were exploring watercolor and and just beginning out do you remember any kind of aha moments for you um i would and again i'm gonna youtube there's uh this one youtube channel um he does mostly nature uh illustration i forget his name it's like john muir john muir law or something oh yeah john muir laws he's terrific yeah and he had this great statement um that really stuck with me and it's that um you know value does all the work but color gets all the credit you know oh, that's so, beautiful so that this notion that you know you, you focus so much on the color because that's that's what's so appealing but you could paint something in a completely different color than it is in reality and it would still represent the same as long as you had um the right the right values mm -hmm. um so that was a big insight it's like oh okay i get it that's what because you know values I think as a beginner is a very elusive concept. It's like, what does that mean? Like, does that mean like good or bad? That kind of value or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but just like the relative difference between, you know, kind of light and dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's something I tell myself and, and um, other artists or uh, students of mine all the time is just make those darks dark. Um, yeah. As you painted, I mean, you have a real, voice I feel now in your work like when I look at your your sketches and prints and everything that you you have um how, do you feel that there was a little bit of a journey in finding finding your voice or did that come pretty naturally I feel that that's something that we all do and is you know as we learn from other people we also have to evolve our voice yeah I think you know initially I was really heavily influenced by the urban sketchers so again like I said the the um you know, the, 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 the pen and wash kind of look. And then um, as I delve deeper into, you know, what's out there in terms of instructional videos on, on watercolor, like um, Gary Tucker was a, you know, I mentioned, I brought him up. He's got a great one. And, you know, I was pretty influenced by him. Like he, he did paintings where he just used um, uh, ultramarine and burnt sienna. And from those two colors got full range of values and was able to, you know, create beautiful landscapes. It's like, oh, yeah, so watching him work and how he looks at light and cool and, and value really kind of started to um, influence, you know, how, how I approach the painting. Also, I think like one, as a beginner, like you would paint, or I would only paint local color, right? I saw a color here and I would try to blend it and then paint that. And then I watched more videos where I saw, you know, this use of washes. So mm -hmm. first like something really pale to just establish light and cool and then the mid values and then, then um, you know, it's like a camera bringing things into focus. First, it starts off kind of blurry. And then as you stop down the aperture, you dial in more detail. Um, so that's one of, that was another aha moment. It's like, oh, I don't have to paint everything in its, in its final form from the very beginning. <laughs> you know, it's, it's this kind of, um, it's, it, it's a process, you know. Okay, so we've got the background here. Uh, one thing I like about this background is that it's pretty, pretty big shapes, right? You have this big foreground that's, uh, you know, kind of highly saturated, pretty bright, and then things recede. And I liked how this river here was kind of a mirror of the road up here. And it's just generally a, a pretty nice framing. Um, I'm going to try to paint the cyclist reference photo. And oh, and I'll, I'll just uh, pause one sec and just mention again to everyone that if you go to my bio, the at art toolkit bio, and there's a link, it says live demonstration reference photo. And that should pull up the uh, reference image that um, Russ and I have. And uh, I'll have a recording of this demo as well. So if you want to go back and watch this, it should end up in our Instagram, um, IGTV, and I'll be posting a recording to YouTube as well. Um, cool. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, Russ, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so... The cyclist is kind of an interesting form. Um, I remember watching tons of videos of how to paint just a general figure and you can do like this kind of body shape and legs. The cyclist, you know, depending on, you know, how they're riding, if they're, uh, you know, tucked in racing or upright, you know, you can kind of um, denote that by like the position of the head relative to the shoulders. Do you have a little scrap stuff. piece of paper? You might noodle yeah, out a couple was, bikers for us. Yeah, I was gonna grab, hold on. Oh. 
Yeah, I love I love your biker your figures because they're like super minimal. <laughs> yeah, but they get a real sense of that gesture of action. Yeah, so typically, you know, I would start with the shoulders to kind of just establish where the, the head's going to be. And then I would draw the trunk of the body. You know, again, like my style is fairly loose. So I don't try to draw every flap of clothing. And then usually once I have this, the next part I, I look at is the space between the torso and the arm, mm -hmm. because this will kind of denote their body position if they're upright or not. So I'm working off of that reference photo. And oh, just I, instead of drawing the arm, I try to draw that negative shape. And it, it, it seems to get it more accurate. The right? space so roughly, in between, yeah. Yeah, because if you concentrate on the arm, then, you know, the arm's not what's important. It's this like negative space be between here. Uh, so we have that, you know, there's kind of a, a handlebar here. Um, there's a, a Swift Industries bag right there. And, then, <laughs> and the next kind of line I look for is where the hips are. So generally that's about here. And then this is in the reference photo, this would be the left glute, this would be the right glute. And then where does the leg come down? So about here, and then there's the calf. And I usually draw the body first, because then that'll give me a sense of, you know, how to scale the bike. Um, and, you know, there's like, there's the other leg here, but that, you know, like in the scale that we're going to be painting, it's not really important. Um, and then you have the front wheel, which is kind of the oval um, because of the angle. And then we have kind of the, the rear wheel. Which and is, all of a sudden, uh, it just comes together, and she's ready to ride off the page. Yeah, rear wheel, you know, slightly slightly larger than, than the front because of perspective. I don't get as granular as to put in the cassette and stuff. But, you know, usually I, I indicate some kind of saddle here and maybe that and then there. And the next thing is, you know, the head. So, like I mentioned, head positioning super important, right? So head up high, you know, just cruising along. Um, Head down low, you know, kind of indicates, you know, I'm going for a little bit more serious ride. Another thing I like to do, which I'm going to do on this painting, is just add a little floopy fabric. <laughs> you know, just a little dash of, of motion that's that's usually not there. Ah, uh-huh. Those little touches just to give some energy. Yeah. And also, like I mentioned, uh, using highlights. So imagine this is the, the cyclist. Um, again, establish the shoulder the hips, you know, there's one leg that's going to be long like this, and then one leg that's a little bit foreshortened because it's pedaling back. Um, and then just a kind of a line for the wheel. So if I painted this, like you wouldn't know which direction it's going yet. Actually, I'll just, I'll color over this real quick just so we have time. <laughs> yeah, I think we've got a few minutes. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so neat to see how these real simple little figures um, are so expressive. Yeah. So I went a little. You have a go-to dark you like to use when you go in for these these dark darks. Indigo. <laughs> Indigo. <laughs> it's a good one. I, I used to use a uh, black or um, yeah, like lamp lamp. It's a lamp black. Um, a little rough. This is a little bit bigger brush than I would, I would have used. But uh, mm -hmm. so at this point, we don't know if the cyclist is going away, away from us, or towards us, right? We uh -huh. just see that this is one of the two. <laughs> yeah. And if you watch, and, the, and you've left just like that little bit of negative space with the arms and the body too, which gives them that sense of like holding on to something and um, yeah, just some dimension there. Yeah. So, you know, typically, you know, there's lots of videos out there, like how to draw, um, you know, walking figures, essentially the same. So at the end, I usually put a highlight at the top. That's where the sun's glinting. And then, you know, you can, oops, it's paint still wet. Um, you can dab a highlight there. And then I'll usually do some, um, you know, at the hands just to separate that a little bit. Usually it's not pure white, right? Yeah. So, so right now this would, uh, indicate that the cyclist is kind of heading toward us because the head's casting a shadow here. But if we extended this highlight across, then it looks like a back. Ah, beautiful. Gosh, it's all in the details. And then you could, to further 
indicate that, you know, put a little dash for the saddle and the top of the tire. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's riding away. Um, so fun stuff like that. <laughs> oh, beautiful. I love all your attention to detail. That's awesome. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, should we dive in? Um, I'm going to follow your lead here. Um, okay. On, so, uh, this great little landscape. Quick release. Is this like quick outside release. your, is this, is this near your house? Yeah, this is uh, about two miles from our place or a mile and a half, and it's um, Jumbo Saddle. This would be the Clark Fork River, Bitterroot Mountains. If you've, if you've ever watched a uh, river runs through it, and it happens, part of it happens in Missoula, and that's where we, where we live. So I'm just gonna quick, quickly sketch in the cyclist here, try to make it a little bit darker. So you got the shoulder, drawing in the torso, hips, uh, trying to get that line, that's good. Head placement, horizontal line for the handlebar, little block for the bag. And then next part would be uh, left glute, just kind of a mass there, right glute and uh, right leg coming down. And got the calf. I tend to draw them also a little on the skinny side because that seems to emote kind of movement uh -huh. um, um, and the light and then, kind of shines around them I feel like yeah there's a little bit just more gap for for the image to breathe so we've got you know a wheel tire um, I'm gonna move the road over it's one of the tricky things I experimented for a while with starting with the wheels first just so I could always place it where I wanted <laughs> uh, but yeah I what, usually what don't pencil get the... are you using there Russ uh, it's a Graph Gear 500. Um, you know, I used to use uh, Black Wings a lot. Uh, yes, definitely super tactile, but I just yeah. like the sharpness of a, a, me a mechanical pencil. Um, I, tried, then, I have a thousand here. Those are fun pencils. Yeah. I so do like them just... in the field where they, um, you know, you don't have to worry about your sharpener. Yeah. Yeah. And I love, like, another thing I love is pencil sharpeners. I have not like a huge collection, but more than one person should have. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now I want to see them all, but uh, maybe, maybe that's got, another day. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple brass ones and, you know, uh, you know two-stage pencil sharpeners. Pencil sharpeners are one of those things where you can have the best pencil sharpener and not go broke <laughs> in the entire world. <laughs> I do have an old one my mom gave me from like the 70s called the Pointomatic that I'm, I'm oh. a fan of. <laughs> is, is it a... Name. Is it electric or is it mean? Yeah, it's an electric one that I, I always get nostalgic using. So it takes me back to being like, you know, nine years old and sharpening all my, my colored pencils. Yeah. There's, there's this video of this guy that does a, it's partly a joke, but also a real business, but he does artisanal pencil sh uh, sharpening. Oh, I had so you... seen that. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. What a business, right? <laughs> yeah. Boy, you find your niche and find your passion. Yeah. Um. Okay, so we got our, our cyclist place, we got the, the background. Typically the way I approach a painting is it's mostly a planar painting with a figure, you know, so I'll, I'll focus yeah. on the, the painting first. Um, I'm gonna kind of pre-wet with the mop brush. So just those, those are probably squirrel mops that you're using there. Nice. Uh, these are actually, these We're are synthetic. synthetic. Oh, they're yeah. beautiful. Yeah, these are the Raphael. There's another uh, YouTube uh, watercolor site I follow, uh, Tim Wilmot. Mm -hmm. and he does amazing stuff it looks like chaos in the beginning and he pulls it all together at like the the, the last minute um he's a big fan of these uh, uh synthetic squirrels so uh first thing i'm going to do is just you know one of the things that they tell you is that the sky gets a little yellowish near the horizon do you have a yellow so you like to use like an ochre or a um yeah so this is just warm a, yellow this is just a Daniel Smith um, yellow ochre. And um, I typically like to apply that first rather than go from blue and then that because I tend to get more green that way. But by applying the, the yellow ochre first, it seems to not go green as easily. Do you um, um, tilt your paper when you? Yeah, so this is a slight angle. Um, I'm using actually a, a swift bag to, to prop it up. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're just lying all over your uh, shop there. <laughs> yeah, ha hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> okay, so uh, off camera, I'm mixing up 
uh, what is this? This might be Cerulean or this might be Cobalt. Um, and I just do pretty simple clouds. You know, I'm, I'm actually really terrible at clouds, so I don't try to emphasize them too much. Well, that's, that's the neat thing about clouds too, is like you can look up what, what's in the sky and you don't need to do everything. You can just right. try and get a feel of a few wispy clouds and some of the best yeah. advice I ever got about clouds was like, get in and get out fast, right? Like. Yeah, because yeah, if you if you spend too much time there, like I feel like you can it can take away from everything else. Like you just want, I just I generally like a suggestion of clouds unless the painting is about clouds, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And this painting isn't about clouds. Okay, so we've got that, and uh, next part is to do this kind of distant range here. And I think I'm going to go with a, a mix of ultramarine and just a touch of burnt sienna to, to gray out a little bit, but still have it fairly cool. And Let's this see. is actually, uh -huh. I feel like this one, this mountain's probably the, the trickiest um, yeah. to do it, to do it right in the first pass, because if you go over it later in the painting, then it has too much of a hard edge and it doesn't recede as well. Um, so it's just, waiting for the right amount of dampness. I might actually switch to a little bit uh, less moppy brush. Uh, so uh, size 10 Casaneo, uh, mixing up some French ultramarine and a touch of um, burnt sienna to slightly gray it. Yeah, those compliments. Uh, That's such a nice, nice gray. Yeah. And, and what you were here's... talking about there is like the wetness, like where you can keep a soft edge, but still right. like have some control. Like it's not just going to bleed all over the place so that your brush isn't too wet, like that mop really holding in water, right? Yeah. So I'm painting over this part because this is going to be darker. So I'm not worrying about that so much. I do kind of want to keep a line there, but that, that looks pretty good. I think that'll, I mean, a little dry lighter, but I feel like I, accomplished a, a good soft edge <laughs> <laughs> okay Whew. that's the tricky part <laughs> yeah those big areas those are those are the parts that always get exciting yeah all right what are you gonna do next so um yeah one thing that to learn too is uh just the notion of going from light to dark and and i think we talked about this on when we had you on my youtube channel is protecting the the highlights um so like this part you know is not gonna this isn't gonna be the final local color but i know that this is gonna be darker so i let that go um same thing with this so this is a mix of uh cold cobalt turquoise and a touch of yellow uh, of cad yellow um and this is just the, the distant green fields. I'm going in while it's wet to hopefully um, draw in some of the, the sky and, and create a soft line there. And I'm trying do to you, protect um, Do you always mix your greens or when you're out in the field, do you have a, any, any greens you like to carry for a little uh, um, I, if convenience? I carry, if I carry a green, it's usually a, a hooker's green. And then I'll use that as kind of like a mid-value green and then add add blue or yellow to lighten or darken it. I tend to like to mix the lighter greens. So I feel like with a, a, a cobalt turquoise and a cad yellow, you can get a pretty um, reliable like sap green. So, okay. So just I'm gonna add a little bit more cobalt turquoise there so it doesn't get too light. And oh, turquoise, actually, that's cool. Yeah. Color is so seductive. Yeah. Like <laughs> it is. <laughs> I, I have my, my go to colors, but it's just so much fun to play with other variations. And especially when I'm traveling or, you know, trying out some new subject matters, it can be fun to pull in some new some new colors. Yeah. So I'm mixing up another pool, uh, a little bit more yellow than cobalt turquoise. Let's see how this looks. Uh, it's a little too. And same thing here. Kind of actually want this this part of the hill a little bit cooler. And so and you've just, got uh huh. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, just, yeah, just pulling this down and, and adding more yellow as we get down so it feels a little bit warmer. And I was just going to mention that you've got a Patreon where you've been, you've been doing a lot of demos of your paintings. Yeah, so it's funny because I, you know, my, my YouTube channel is about bikes, but I, but I also combine, you know, other activities. So one of the perks that I've started to offer is a little painting uh, tutorials. And also at a certain level, um, people get a little sketch about this size, you know, at a certain Patreon level. So our audience is pretty cool about, you know, being more than just about bikes. Um, and so while this is still damp, I'm also going to go in here and put some yellow ochre. And uh, I want the road to kind of recede. So I'm going to have a little bit more pigment on the bottom and draw it up. I found that like if I try to do something pale and then go darker, it's harder to control rather than pulling something up from the bottom with more. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's like a great tip. Yep. It's easier to kind of pull it than to like dip back in. Right. Because I've, I've done it where I've started too strong here and to, to have that sense of receiving depth, like I really have to load the brush by this point. So instead, you know, this is kind of the most saturated point that that the road's going to be, and I can pull it up. Um, so there, there's a tip. <laughs> can you say the color again you were using in the uh, road? Uh, so this was kind of a, a yellow ochre, uh, pretty heavy, and then I added this this kind of darkerish uh, burnt sienna color is um, uh, TRO transparent iron oxide, I think. It's basically like a really heavily saturated uh, burnt sienna. <laughs> All right, uh, looking good. I was gonna get fancy and try to figure out how to use my actual live streaming setup and push it through YouTube so I could have picture in picture and everything. Um, <laughs> Cause there, there's software that does that. Um, the trick is that it's, um, it, I think it breaks the, the terms of service. So if you stream with other than your phone, they might ban you. Oh, uh, good to know. Yeah, you've inspired me. I, I, I'm having so much fun with these streams, but I, I might start dipping my toe into um, some other formats. Um, for... Yeah. So you know what you're doing is... with those. <laughs> <laughs> so while this is still damp-ish. I think I might go in a little bit and just um, start to just indicate kind of uh, the lines of the hill. And, and that's where you've got it. value. And that's, that's something I feel that you, in your work, you've got a real nice, strong sense of value in um, where that, that brings in the dimension and some of that atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, and like I try to, so these are going to be a little bit, you know, heavier in pigment. Um, try to go in when it's wet so it has kind of a nice soft edge. And then as I work, as I try to indicate the hills going upwards, um, a little bit more water, less, less pigment, so it recedes. Um, it's hard. Like that's one of the, the things I really struggled with was how to convey depth in something 2, 2D. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's, there's things you can do like, uh, edges, you know, you can make something harder in the foreground. So it's, it gets separated from the background like we did with the mountain, although now it's like too soft. <laughs> ah, geez. <clears throat> or, uh, you know, you can use a uh, color temperature, right. To, to indicate depth. So, you know, they say typically things are, um, in the foreground are warmer than they are in the background. So keeping, you know, the background area is a lot more cool. And as it moves to the foreground, you know, more of that burnt sienna here, more of the cad yellow to, re to really saturate it and, and make it pop. Those are some nice hills. <laughs> You've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm following your inspiration. You know, I'm enjoying your color palette. <laughs> 
you can you, you know way beyond just glaciers it's amazing i know i know i tell you <laughs> greens are something i feel like i'm i'm always learning especially with lots of sketching because my, my personal like artistic comfort zone is around like grays and blues and so yeah um, i enjoy these do you ever like get yourself sketching i don't know little still lives of your bike gear or um i, I see more most of your work is landscape uh i do you know when i first started you know i i would just paint a bag you know, mm -hmm. we have a ton of Swift bags, so I would paint those. <laughs> or a saddle, you know, a saddle is a really cool shape. Um, it's got, you know, kind of edges and, and depth to it, like especially like a nice leather saddle. You can, can control the tone and everything. Um, so yeah, I definitely started with just small objects um, that had some kind of interesting form that could cast some interesting uh, shadow. And um, from there just started ex expanding. Okay, so a little damp. Um, so next part is going to be um, this kind of middle ground hill. And it's going to be a darker value um, than, than the foreground. And it's going to add some nice separation. I feel like that one thing I liked about that photo was it would break up uh, this foreground from, from the background. I gotta say too, I feel like these, these are, uh, paintings are currently at the stage where it can be easy to get discouraged in a way, like yeah. things are kind of mapped out, <laughs> but since there's not that like, since the values aren't like fully pushed and the, you know, it needs to be seen through to really snap together. And I always encourage people to like see their paintings through, like give it the full chance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was another aha moment that um, at least, you know, for me, like every, if you if you paint in this style like building it up there's there's gonna be a lot of the painting where it just looks like a hot mess <laughs> and it doesn't get pulled together until you know the last last third of the play where you know once you start putting in in the deeper values and the details and it starts to make sense but right now it's in that kind of real blobby face <laughs> yeah 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 all right so for this foreground here, I'm gonna mix some ultramarine blue. And what is this? A little ultramarine. And, and uh, perlene green. Do you have that? Oh, nice I do. Green. That is a beautiful, beautiful That's green. a nice color. Mixes yeah. to near black. I think it's right here. So when it goes really concentrated, um, here I'll do a little swatch yeah. of it for everybody. It, um, it's like a great pine tree green mm -hmm. and um, yeah, really fond of that one. Yeah. So for this first pass, I'm going to be using more ultramarine than perlene and then go back with the perlene later to, to add kind of um, more shape to it. But it's, this is kind of that, that first, first good base. Okay. There's so much waiting in watercolor. <laughs> I know that's the hard part. Do we, give them, do we need to give them a quick blast? Maybe everyone can cover their ears for a minute and we can. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. <laughs> okay, everybody, um, just cover your ears. Step away. We'll um, get it over with fast. All right. Oh, yeah, I think I'm better, too. OK, that's good. I know. I, I often try to resist using a hairdryer because I, I, I don't like them very much. But they're so handy. <laughs> they are. <laughs> and uh, no, if I'm not working on multiple pieces, I get impatient. You can. Yeah. I've actually ruined more more, more paintings by not waiting for them to dry. Like, speak, another aha moment was a hairdryer. It's like, oh, you know, it's, it, it just allows more, more control Like once, once you get things to the right dryness. OK. Yeah, and the, the full layers. Yeah, so I've got my mix of, uh, let's see, that's might be a little too dark now. Um, okay, so I'm going in. Love that blue green for those distant hills. Yeah, and what's cool about having the mountain here, it, it defines the, this foreground hill, right? And yep. it just adds, adds so much like pop and contrast right there. So this is where I do try to be a little bit careful. Okay. Whew. 
and then bring this down. Um, and I might go in with just a little, just charge in some colors so it's not too uniform. You know, usually the, the hills are a little bit darker at the bottom anyways. Um, that's one thing like I also struggle with is like trying to, you know, you want to have like a nice wash, but you don't want it, you don't want the wash to be completely the same color, or otherwise it gets a little bit boring. Yep, and flat, uh-huh. So, okay, here I'm starting to indicate some trees, um, just because that's kind of a nice detail in the photo. I think that's something too, you know, we were talking earlier about the contrast between local color and mm -hmm. kind of value. And then that freedom with painting to depart from like your perceived color and to like exaggerate right. them a little bit, like whether exaggerating some of the blue in the hills or to kind of let your eyes heighten that. And I think that can come with, with practice and giving yourself maybe little challenges of seeing what happens when you do like just push something one way or the other. Um, yeah. Is that something you've experienced? I feel like some of your paintings, you get such like, you've got some with these, you know, really yellow overall sun, you know, sunrise or sunset tones and that. Um... Yeah, I like that. I forget who, which, which, which among the many YouTube channels I watch, but they talked about like the mother color, you know, so kind of the, the color that, that sets the tone. Um, so if it's like a cool painting, it could be ultramarine or if it's a sunset, it could be kind of a, a purple color. And then building around that, but having either that color in touches every other part of the painting or is, gets mixed in with every other part of the, the painting to, to, to create harmony. Yeah. I think about like having the colors hold hands so that, yeah, yeah, it's sort of through, throughout the whole piece. Yeah. All right. So I, lo I love that yeah. YouTube has been such a part of your journey of learning because you are so <laughs> generous in your own YouTubes as well. And <laughs> really fitting. <laughs> it's cheaper than art school. It's <laughs> <laughs> something that a lot of us are turning to these days for our, um, you know, uh, learning yeah. and entertainment and all that. All right. We're getting yeah. close for us. Yeah. So, um, so I think, like I like how I mean you see how that that the mountain just kind of it really creates that nice definition like you yeah. totally nailed it too yeah um, so we're gonna do a little bit more work in the foreground I feel like I've lost the rear or uh, mine I think you did a better job I'm, I lost the the distant mountains a little bit so I might go back in here and then maybe do another really light wash it would have been smarter to do that before this but you know this it's live uh, but for for the do. foreground. For the foreground, I'm going to add some foliage, and the, I'm going to switch to this guy, which I absolutely love for for just real kind of gestural uh, foliage. Um, so apologies if you don't have that at home. Uh, and I'm going to mix up a, a stronger pigmented version of this green, so a lot more cobalt turquoise and yellow and do it fairly dry, so less water. This is the stage where, you know, I think of tightening down the aperture on the lens and trying to add more detail. So I'm spreading this and just, oh, I can go darker. So I'm gonna add some ultramarine because I want it to separate from the tone that's already there. And there's this great, um, and you can see I'm just kind of dabbing the, the splayed edge and that gives yeah. a nice quasi random edge. And the trick is as you move from the foreground to the background to make those marks smaller, to again, make it recede. Um, and then you can add, you know, touch, a little bit of blue in there, um, but. Oh, that comes together so beautifully. Yeah, and just, just dabbing, you know, like ha happy little grass, just. <laughs> oh, here you got your, your Bob, Bob Ross. <laughs> there you go. I don't think we'll ever live down Bob Ross. <laughs> no. We're tired of him. <laughs> right. For better or for worse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what's cool is like, 
even like the, the negative space, I feel like indicates like lighter blades of grass. Um, but just trying to keep it light and small as you get further away, just so you get that illusion of depth. And I might, I'm going to start drawing some, or painting some of the, the grass that's in the, middle of the, ah, in the middle of the road in the same fashion. Ah, and all of a sudden things are starting to feel more, more tight. Yeah. I like, I like your analogy of the aperture. Yeah, I was trying to understand like how, you know, how some artists can just pull the chaos together, you know, at the, at the last, at the last second. And that's a, like, I used to be a, a portrait photographer um, many moons ago. So, you know, photography was a, kind of a, a natural analogy. So it's pretty cool. I mean, I love these brushes and they're so cheap. They're so cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The tricky part is I think this has goat hair. So kind of like your, 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 your hockey brushes, they shed initially. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of my early paintings, I needed like a toothpick to, to take off a, a, a stray hair. But once, once you pass the awkward <laughs> shedding uh, <laughs> stage of the brush, uh, they just do a fun expressive marks. You know, great for trees, great for foliage, um, just enough control. Uh, there's a there's a guy on Instagram named Young Hong something I forget what it's like a number, but he's he, all he uses is are these Sumi brushes and he just goes in bold, you know, almost straight out of the tube. It's amazing what he can do with the, the watercolor. We're gonna have to get a list from you of some of your favorite um, inspirations <laughs> to include in a follow up. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, we've just got a few more minutes. Can you should we dive in on the person or um, we need okay. to? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Close a little final, uh, and um, I'm also curious what's coming up for you. I, I just saw someone asking about, um, uh, um, yeah, just uh, other things on your on your horizon. Gotcha. Uh, more YouTube videos. Uh, so I'm going in with some uh, Qu Quin Red. This I, I feel like this is a good contrast to all the cool colors. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, our our YouTube channel. Um, if you search on YouTube, is Pathless Pedaled. And it's we're we should get to a hundred thousand subscribers this year, which is kind of exciting. Yeah, yeah we're currently at seventy six thousand. Um, That's huge. Yeah. So now I'm switching to Indigo, and then so just gave it the red jersey, uh, Indigo for the rest of the body here. Red's um, a nice little pop against the um, all yeah. those greens. And you'll see like the indigo kind of creeps up, which is fine because we want to denote some shadow. So I'm actually going in here, putting a little shadow under the arm, uh, handlebar, and then one tricky thing about cyclists or with any figure, like if you want to make it expressive, you have to do it kind of quickly. You know, there's mm -hmm. something about the, so it just creates some nice, makes it look more gestural. Um, Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. Okay, so moving on to the, the wheel here. Same thing. There's the fork. I'm just following the, the pencil park marks we made earlier. Um, and then the head. And then I'm going to do something really quick here. I'm going to go in with some... Uh, Perlene green, if I can find it. And just add a little bit more shadow to the foliage. I feel like it's, it's not quite poppy enough. I mean, it's a little bit wetter than I would normally go, but just just a couple touches. Tighten that up. Just, yeah. Get, and do you want to throw a little to, shadow for the figure too? Or? What do you feel about yeah. that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, you're, you're, I like your figure good. better than mine. My uh, my wheel doesn't <laughs> quite sit on the on the ground, but <laughs> you've had some more practice than me with those figures. <laughs> yeah, so 
for the figure, again, uh, indigo, maybe a touch of red to, to purple it up. And then I usually just try to, to, to draw it out from the, the wheel. If you can get like a nice dry brush effect, that's always cool. So we got the figure. Um, and then I'm gonna do, so in the original photo, there is, it's spring. So there's lots of flowers. I'm just gonna tap in some cad yellow, uh, pretty dense. So they'll stand up to, to the, the dark colors. Um, oh. Might need another pass. So I, so I love your I love your technique too. I often use like a toothbrush for my splatters, but you had a nice tapping action there too. Yeah. Um, then I think I'm gonna. In, there are some trees back here that I might okay. So again, this is just tightening up the lens. Um, try not to go too dark to to take away from the foreground, but this just gives some perspective. And all of a sudden it's a, it's a little painting. <laughs> the whole thing yeah. snaps together. <laughs> yeah. Um, how much more time do we, are we? Are I think we... we've got about two more minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately, Instagram okay. kicks us off at, at an hour. Um, okay. But I'd love if you could take a, a picture of your final piece, if you want to do any little final touches and, um, it's just okay. come together beautifully, Russ. And I really appreciate too, like seeing your, um, you know, your approach to figures, I think is awesome. Cause kind of getting the gesture of that bicycle and. Um... Yeah, so just adding the, the highlights with the white gouache, pretty much just straight out of the tube. Like I don't even put on the palette um, just to get it. And yeah, <clears throat> if we had more time, I'd go into, you know, to find the, the distant mountains. I lost it, I lost the edge a little bit, but. Yeah. Oh, Russ, that's beautiful. Boy, you've really got a sense of the flowers and foliage and, uh, and hills. Yeah. Well, I don't know, maybe if we have one in our last little minute, just for fun. When we do tape down stuff, I love taking off the tape because right. pulling stuff off the board gets so satisfying. <laughs> it does. Yeah, then all of a sudden you get that crisp contrast too to the um, the it, white it paper turns edge. into it turns into art. It <laughs> does. It does. You get that little frame. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I nice. really want to thank you for painting with us today and sharing your inspiration and all that you're doing on on Pathless Pedal. It's super inspiring, and I'm I'm stoked you like our tools for for going out and hope to keep um keep hearing about your all your adventures big and small keep us posted yeah we'll do yeah so th thanks so much for having me yeah and thank you everyone who joined us we'll have a, a recording up of this and um yeah make sure to follow russ on youtube as well check out uh everything he's got over there on, on